Chapter 31, The Sea Monster. Wednesday, August 19th. Fortunately, the wind, which for the present blows with some violence, has allowed us to escape from the scene of the unparalleled and extraordinary struggle. Hans, with his usual imperturbable calm, remained at the helm. My uncle, who for a short time had been withdrawn from his absorbing reveries by a novel by the novel in incidents of the sea fight, fell back again, apparently, into a brown study. His eyes were fixed impatiently on the widespread ocean. Our voyage now became monotonous and uniform. Dull as it has become, I have no desire to have it broken by any repetition of perils and adventures of yesterday. Thursday, August 20th. The wind is now north-northeast, and blows very irregularly. It is changed to fitful gusts. The temperature is exceedingly high. We are now progressing at the average rate of about 10 miles and a half per hour. About 12 o'clock, a distant sound of thunder fell upon our ears. I make a note of the fact without even venturing a suggestion as to its cause. It was, it was one continued roar of the sea falling over mighty rocks. Far off in the distance, said the professor dogmatically, there is some rock or some islands against which the sea lashed fury by the wind is breaking violently. Hans, without saying a word, clambered to the top of the mast, but could make out nothing. The ocean was level in every direction as far as the eye could reach. Three hours passed away without any sign or to indicate what might be before us the sound began to assume that of a mighty cataract. I expressed my opinion on this point strongly to my uncle. He merely shook his head. I, however, am strongly impressed by a conviction that I am not wrong. Are we advancing towards some mighty waterfall which shall cast us into the abyss? Probably this mode of descending into the abyss may be agreeable to the professor, because it would be something like the vertical descent he is so eager to make. I entertain a very different opinion. Whatever be the truth, it is, a, it is certain that not many leagues distant, there must be some extraordinary phenomenon. For as we advance, the roar becomes something mighty and stupendous. Is it in the water or in the air? I cast hasty glances aloft at the suspended vapors, and I seek to penetrate their mighty depths. But the vault above is tranquil, the clouds, which are now elevated to the very summit, appear utterly still and motionless, and completely lost in the eradication of the electric light. It is necessary, therefore, to seek for the cause of this phenomenon elsewhere. I examine the horizon, now perfectly calm, calm pure, and free from all haze. Its aspect still remains unchanged, but if this awful noise proceeds from a cataract, if so, to speak in plain English, this vast interior ocean is precipitated into the lower basin. If these tremendous roars are produced by the noise of falling waters, the current, which would increase in activity and its increasing swiftness, would give me some idea of the extent of the peril which we were menaced. I consult the current. It simply does not exist. There is no such thing. An empty bottle cast into the water lies to leeward without motion. About four o'clock, Hans rises, clambers up the mass, and reaches the trunk itself. From this elevated position, his looks are cast around. They take in vast circumference of the ocean. At last, his eyes remain fixed. His face expresses no astonishment, but his eyes slightly dilate. He has seen something at last, cried my uncle. I think so, I replied. Hans came down, stood beside us, <coughs> and pointed with his right hand to the south. Down there, he said. There, replied my uncle. And seizing his telescope, he looked at it with great attention for about a minute, which to me appeared an age. I knew not what to think or expect. Yes, yes, he cried in a tone of considerable surprise. There it is. What, I asked, a tremendous spurt of water rising out of the waves. 
Some other marine monster, I cried, already alarmed, perhaps. Then let us steer more to the westward, for we know what we have to expect from the Andalusian animals, was my eager reply. Go ahead, said my uncle. I turned towards Hans. Hans was at the tiller, still steering with his usual imperturbable calm. Nevertheless, if from the distance which separates us from this creature, a distance which must be estimated at not less than a dozen leagues, one could see the column of water spurting from the blowhole of the great animal. His dimensions must be something preternatural. To fly is, therefore, the course to be suggested by the ordinary prudence. But we have not come into the part of the world to be prudent. Such is my uncle's determination. We, accordingly, continue to advance. To advance. The nearer we come, the loftier is the spouting water. What monster can fill himself with such huge volumes of water and then unceasingly spout them out in such lofty jets? At eight o'clock in the evening, reckoning as above ground, where there is day and night, <coughs> we are not more than two leagues from the mighty beast. Its long, black, enormous, mountainous body lies on the top of the water like an island. But then sailors have been said to have gone ashore on sleeping whales, mistakenly mistaking them for land. Is it an illusion or is it fear? Its length cannot be less than thousand than a thousand fathoms. What then is the cetaceous monster which no Cuvier even thought? It is quite motionless and presents the appearance of sleep. The sea seems unable to lift him upwards. It is rather the waves which break on the huge and gigantic frame. The water spout, rising to a height of 500 feet, breaks in spray with a dull, sullen roar. We advance like senseless lunatics towards this mighty mass. Honestly confess, I honestly confess that I was abjectly afraid. I declared that I would go no farther. I threatened in my terror to cut the sheet of sail. I attacked the, prof I attacked the professor with considerable acrimony, calling him foolhardy, mad. I know not what. He made no answer. Suddenly, the imperturbable Hans once more pointed his finger to the menacing object. Hold me! An island, cried my uncle. An island, I replied. Struggling my sh shrugging my shoulders at this poor attempt at deception. Of course it is, cries my uncle, bursting into a loud and joyous laugh. <laughs> but the water spout. Geyser, said Hans. Yes, of course, a geyser, replied my uncle, still laughing. A geyser like those common in Iceland. Jets like this are the great wonders of the country. At first, I would not allow that I have been so grossly deceived. What could be more ridiculous than to have taken an island for a marine monster? But kick as one may, one must yield to evidence, and I was finally convinced of my error. It was nothing, after all, but a natural phenomenon. As we approached nearer and nearer, the dimensions of the liquid sheaf of water became truly grand and stupendous. The island had at a distance presented the appearance of an enormous whale, whose head rose high above the waters. The geyser, a word the Icelanders pronounce, geysir, and which signifies fury, rose majestically from its summit. Dull detonations are heard every now and then, and the enormous jet, taken as it were with sudden fury, shakes its plume of vapor and bounds into the first layer of the clouds. It is alone. Neither spurts of vapor nor hot springs surround it, and the whole volcanic power of that region is concentrated in one sublime column. The rays of electric light mix with this dazzling sheet, every drop as it falls, assuming the prismatic colors of the rainbow. Let us go sh on shore, said the professor, after some minutes of silence. It is necessary, however, to take great precautions in order to avoid the weight of falling waters, which would cause the raft to founder in an instant. Hans, however, steers admirably and brings us to the other extremity of the island. 
I was the first to leap on the rock. My uncle followed. While the eider duck hunter remained still, like a man above any childish sources of astonishment. We were now walking. On grass. Oh, we lose me. I was the first to leap on the rock. My uncle followed, while the eider duck hunter remained still, like a man above any childish sources of astonishment. We were now walking on granite mixed with salacious sandstone. The soil shivered under our feet like the sides of boilers in which overheated steam is forcibly combined. It is burning. We soon came in sight of the little central basin from which rose the geyser. I plunged a thermometer into the water which ran bubbling from the center, and it marked a heat of 160 degrees. This water, therefore, came from some place where the heat was intense. This was singularly in contradiction with the theories of Professor Hardwick. I could not help telling him my opinion on the subject. Well, said he sharply, and what does this prove against my doctrine? Nothing, I replied dryly, seeing that I was running my head against a foregone conclusion. Nevertheless, I am compelled to confess that until now we have most have been most remarkably fortunate, and that this voyage is being accomplished in most favorable conditions of temperature. But it appears evident, in fact certain, that we should sooner or later arrive at one of those regions where the central heat will reach its utmost limits and will go far beyond all the possible gradations of thermometers. Visions of the Hades of the ancients, believed to be the center of the earth, floated through my imagination. We shall, however, see what we shall see. That is the professor's favorite phrase now, having christened the volcanic island by the name of his nephew. The leader of the expedition turned away and gave the signal for embarkation. I stood still, however, for some minutes, gazing upon the magnificent geyser. I soon was able to perceive that the upper tendency of the water was irregular. Now it diminished in intensity, and then suddenly it regained new vigor, which I attributed to the variation of the pressure of the accumulated vapors in its reservoir. At last, we took our departure, <clears throat> going carefully round the projecting and rather dangerous rocks of the southern side. Hans had taken advantage of this brief halt to repair the raft. Before we took our final departure from the island, however, I made some observations to calculate the distance we had gone over, and I put them down to, in my journal. Since we left Port Gresham, we had traveled 270 leagues, more than 800 miles, on this great inland sea, we were, therefore, 620 leagues from Iceland, and exactly under England. Chapter 32. The Battle of the Elements. Friday, August 21st. This morning, the magnificent geyser had wholly disappeared. The wind had freshened up, and we were fast leaving the neighborhood of Henry's Island. Even the roaring sound of the mighty column was lost in the ear. The weather, if under the circumstances we may use such an expression, is about to change very suddenly. The atmosphere is being gradually loaded with vapors, which carry with them the electricity formed by the constant evaporation of the saline waters. The clouds are slowly but sensibly falling towards the sea and are assuming a dark, olive texture. The electric rays can scarcely pierce through the opaque curtain, <clears throat> which has fallen like a drop scene before, before this wondrous theater. <coughs> Excuse me. Age of which another and terrible drama is soon to be enacted. This time, it is no fight of animals. It is the fearful battle of the elements. I feel that I am very peculiarly influenced, 
as all creatures are on land when a deluge is about to take place. The the cumuli, a perfectly oval kind of cloud, cumuli, perfectly oval kind of cloud piled upon the south, presented a most awful and sinister appearance with a pitiless aspect often seen before a storm. The air is extremely heavy. The sea is comparatively calm. In the distance, the clouds have assumed the appearance of enormous bales of balls of cotton, or rather pods, piled one above the other in picturesque confusion. By degrees, they appear to swell out, break, and gain in number what they lose in grandeur. Their heaviness is so great that they are unable to lift themselves from the horizon. But under the influence of the upper currents of air, they are gradually broken up, becoming much darker and then present the appearance of one single layer of formidable character. Now and then, a lighter cloud, still lit up from above, rebounds upon the gray carpet and is lost in the opaque mass. There can be no doubt that the entire atmosphere is saturated with electric fluid. I am myself wholly impregnated by... My hairs literally stand on end, as if under the influence of galvanic battery. If one of my companions ventured to touch me, I think he would receive rather a violent and unpleasant shock. About ten o'clock in the morning, the symptoms of the storm became more thorough and decisive. The wind appeared to soften down as if to take breath for a renewed attack. The vast funeral pall above above us looked like a huge bag, like the cave of Aeolus, in which the storm was collecting its forces for the attack. I tried all I could not to believe (coughs) in the menacing signs of the sky, and yet I could not avoid saying, as it were, involuntarily, I believe we are going to have bad weather. The professor made me no answer. He was in a horrible and a detestable humor to see the ocean stretching interminably before his eyes. On hearing my words, he simply shrugged his shoulders. We shall have a tremendous storm, I said again, pointing to the horizon. These clouds are falling lower and lower upon the sea, as if to crush it. A great silence prevailed. The wind wholly ceased. Nature assumed a dead calm and ceased to breathe. Upon the mast, where I noticed a sort of slight ignis fatus, the sail hangs in loose, heavy folds. The raft is motionless in the midst of dark, heavy sea, without undulation, without motion. It is still as glass, but as we are making no progress, what is the key? What is the use of keeping up the sail, which may be the cause of our perdition if the tempest should suddenly strike us without warning? Let us lower the sail, I said. It is only an act of common prudence. No, no, cried my uncle in an exasperated tone. A hundred times no. Let the wind strike us and do its worst. Let the storm sweep us away where it will. Only let me see the glimmer of some coast, of some rocky cliffs, even if they dash our rafts into a thousand pieces. No, keep up the sail no matter what happens. These words were scarcely uttered when the sudden southern horizon underwent a sudden and violent change. The long accumulated vapors were resolved into water, and the air required to fill up the void produced became a wild and raging tempest. It came from the most distant corners of the mighty cavern. It raged from every point of the compass. It roared, it yelled, it shrieked with the glee of demons let loose. The darkness increased and became indeed darkness visible. The raft rose and fell with the storm and bounded over the waves. My uncle was cast headlong upon the deck. I, with great difficulty, dragged myself toward him. He was holding on with might and main to the end of a cable and appeared to gaze with pleasure and delight at the spectacle of the unchained elements. Hans never moved a muscle his long hair driven hither and thither by the tempest and scattered wildly over his motionless face. 
gave him a most extraordinary appearance. For every single hair was illuminated, illuminated by little sparkling sprigs. His countenance presents an extraordinary appearance of antediluvian man, a true contemporary of Megatherium. Still, the mast holds good against the storm. <clears throat> the, stale, the sail spreads out and fills like a soap bubble around, about to burst. The raft rushes at a pace impossible to estimate, but still less swiftly than the body of water displaced beneath it. The rapidity of, wit, of which may be seen in, by the lines which fly right and left in the wake. The sail! The sail! I cried, making a trumpet out of my hands, and then endeavoring to lower it. Let it alone! said my uncle, more exasperated than ever. Yes! said Hans, gently shaking his head. Nevertheless, the rain formed a roaring cataract before this horizon of which we were in search and to which we were rushing like madmen. <clears throat> But before this wilderness of waters reached us, the mighty veil of clouds was torn in twain. The sea became, began to foam wildly, and the electricity produced by some vast and extraordinary chemical attraction in the upper layer of clouds is brought into play. To the fearful claps of thunder are added dazzlingly, dazzling flashes of lightning such as I have never seen. The flashes crossed one another, hurled from every side, <clears throat> while the thunder came pealing like an echo. The mass of, of vapor becomes incandescent. The hailstones which strike the metal of our boots and our weapons are actually luminous. The waves as they rise appear to be fire-eating monsters, beneath which seethes an intense fire their crests surmounted by combs of flame. My eyes are dazzled blindly by the intensity of light. My ears are deafened by the awful roar of the elements. <clears throat> I am compelled to hold on to the mass, which bends like a reed beneath the violent storms to which none ever before seen by mariners bore any resemblance. Here, my traveling notes become very incomplete loose and vague. I have only been able to make out one or two fugitive observations, jotted down in a mere mechanical way. But even their brevity, even their obscurity, shows the emotions which overcame me. Sunday, August 23rd. Where are we to go? In what region are we wandering? We are still carried forward with an inconceivable rapidity. The night has been fearful, something not to be described. The storm shows no signs of cessation. We exist in the midst of an uproar which has no name. The detonations, as of artillery, are incessant. Our ears literally bleed. We are unable to exchange a word or hear each other speak. The lightning never ceases to flash for a moment. I can see the zigzags after a rapid dart strike the arched roof of this, of this mightiest of mighty vaults. <clears throat> if it were to give way and fall upon us, other lightnings plunge their forked streaks in every direction and take the form of globes of fire, which explode like bombshells over our beleaguered city. The gr general crash and roar do not apparently increase. It has already gone far beyond what human ear can appreciate. If all the power powder magazines in the world were to explode together, it would be impossible for us to hear worse noise. <clears throat> there is constant emission of light from the storm clouds. The electric banner is incessantly released. Evidently, the gaseous principles of the air are out of order. Innumerable columns of water rush up like water spouts and fall back upon the sur on the ocean and foam. Whither are we going? My uncle still lies at full length upon the raft, without speaking, without taking any note of time. The heat increases. I look at the thermometer. To my surprise, it, 
it indicates the exact figure is here rubbed out in my manuscript. Monday, August 24th. <clears throat> this terrible storm will never end. Why should not this state of the atmosphere, so dense and murky, once modified again, remain definitive? <clears throat> we are utterly broken and harassed by fatigue. Pod remains as just as usual. The raft runs to the southeast invariably. We have now already run 200 leagues from newly discovered island. About 12 o'clock, the storm became worse than ever. We are obliged now to fasten every bit of cargo tightly on the deck of the raft, or everything would be swept away. We make ourselves most fast too, each man lashing the other. The waves drive over us so that several times we are actually underwater. <clears throat> we had been under the painful necessity of abstaining from speech for three days and three nights. We opened our mouths, we moved our lips, but no sound came. Even when we placed our mouths to each other's ears, it was the same. The wind carried the voice away. My uncle once contrived to get his head close to mine after several almost vain endeavors. He appeared to, to my nearly exhausted sense to articulate some word. I had a notion, more from intuition than anything else, that he said to me, We are lost. I took out my notebook which under the most desperate circumstances I never parted and wrote a few words legibly as I could. Take in sail. With a deep sigh, he nodded his head and acquiesced. His head had scarcely time to fall back in the position from which he had momentarily raised <clears throat> as it then a disc or ball of fire appeared on the very edge of the raft. Our devoted, our doomed, craft. The mast and sail are carried away bodily, and I see them swept to a prodigious height like a kite. We are frozen, actually shivered with terror. The ball of fire, half white, half azure colored, about the size of 10-inch bombshell, moved along, turning with prodigious rapidity to leeward of the storm. It ran about here, there, and everywhere. It clambered up, up one of the bulwarks of the raft. It leapt up the sack of provisions and then finally descended lightly, fell like a football and landed on our powder barrel. Horrible situation. An explosion, of course, was now in inevitable. By heaven's mercy, it was not so. The dazzling disc moved on one side. It approached Hans, who looked at it with singular fixity. Then it approached my uncle, who cast himself on his knees to avoid it. <clears throat> it came towards me. As I stood pale and shuddering in the dazzling light and heat, it pirouetted round my feet, which I endeavored to withdraw. An odor of nitrous gas filled the whole air. It penetrated to the throat, to the lungs. I felt already to choke. Why is it that I cannot draw my feet? Are they riveted by to the flooring of the raft? No, the fall of the electric globe has turned all the iron on board into lodestones. The instruments, the tools, the arms are clanging together with awful and horrible noise. The nails of my heavy boots adhere closely to the plate of iron encrusted in the wood. I cannot withdraw my foot. It is the old story again of the mountain, Adamant. At last, by a violent and almost superhuman effort, I tear it away just as the ball, which is still executing its gyratory motions, is about to run round it and drag me with it. If, oh, what an immense, stupendous light. The globe of fire bursts. We are enveloped in cascades of living fire, which flood the space around with luminous matter. Then all went out and darkness once more fell upon the deep. I had just time to see my uncle once more cast apparently senseless on the floor of the raft. Hans at the helm, spitting fire under the influence of the electricity which seemed to have gone through him. Whither are we going? I ask. And Echo answers, whither? <clears throat> 
Tuesday, August 25th. I have just come out of a long fainting fit. The awful and hideous storm still continues. The lightning has increased in vividness and pours out its fiery wrath like a brood of serpents let loose in the atmosphere. Are we still upon the sea? Yes, a mirror being carried away along with the incredible velocity. We have passed under England, under the Channel, under France, probably under the whole extent of Europe. Another awful clamor in the distance. This time, it is certain that the sea is breaking upon the rocks at no great distance. Then, oh no, uh -oh. what has happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, route reversed. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. It went through a bad storm. Sounds like a uh, West Texas storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. <laughs>